So welcome. Thank you for coming today, uh, Mr. Secretary General and uh, colleagues, but also, more, most importantly, all of our students who are here. This is mainly a student audience. That's the Secretary General's uh, interest in talking to students, not only from SICE, but from a number of other uh, partner universities. And uh, we're delighted that we could all come together for this event. Uh, my name's Dan Hamilton. I direct the uh, Center for Transatlantic Relations here at, at Johns Hopkins SICE. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome the Secretary General here. Um, he's had, you know, a very successful career, not only at NATO, but also in Danish politics. And Mr. Secretary General, you may not, uh, be, you probably know this now, but the American semester uh, cycle ends about now. Most of our students in the second year of our program are going to graduate, uh, I think. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> in about a week or so. Uh, so they're coming to the end of their career here and, uh, and having a master's degree. And the students might be interested to know that when I was looking at the Prime Minister, the Secretary General's uh, background, the year he got his master's degree in Denmark, he uh, immediately joined the Danish parliament, was elected to the Danish parliament. So that's a good guy to what you do right when you get your graduate degree. Uh, it's a pretty good gig. Um, he made good use of that gig for a number of years, uh, not only in the parliament, but also in the government. Uh, given Washington politics today, you might be interested to know that he was actually the, what's called the Minister for Taxation in the Danish government. Uh, he was also the Danish ne negotiator uh, uh, that, on the negotiations that finally led to the creation of the euro. So you, also interesting topic these days, and we're all looking forward to seeing how that uh, turns out. Um, he formed his first government as prime minister at the beginning of the, uh, the last decade uh, and was the prime minister successfully through three different uh, periods uh, and uh, I think by all accounts uh, led a tremendously effective Danish government. I think when we work on transatlantic issues, we look to Denmark in many ways as sort of examples of best practice in a variety of uh, fields and I think much of it is, is due to your uh, leadership. He was appointed Secretary General uh, at the uh, Strasbourg Kale Summit of NATO. Uh, it was just a few months after the Obama administration took office. I actually happened to be there. I don't know if you know that because of the security. I was asked to speak in the morning to a group of young Atlanticists that had come to Strasbourg Kale. And actually, there are a few of them in this audience today uh, who were there and are here. And so I know they're looking forward to that. The NATO Lisbon Summit uh, was... Uh, a very important turning point uh, just recently, last November. Uh, it was a point where NATO had to create a strategic concept and also decide critical issues for its future, including its engagement in Afghanistan. And besides sort of the conceptual work, of course, more importantly, is its everyday operational business. Uh, many people, I think, today wonder, after the end of the Cold War, why NATO? But the reality is that NATO is busier than ever. Today is busier than it's ever been in its history, and the Secretary General has to manage multiple missions uh, ranging far uh, from European and, and North Atlantic shores. So it's a really a great pleasure to uh, introduce the Secretary General, to hear him, and to welcome here to Johns Hopkins SICE, the Secretary General. Dr. Hamilton, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, it is a real privilege uh, to, to speak to you here today at this prestigious uh, venue. Um, and let me start by uh, thanking the School of Advanced International uh, Studies for hosting me and uh, thanking you all uh, for coming. Um, every time I come to the United States, I'm struck by the warmth and uh, generosity uh, of the American people. Uh, and also by your country's um, abiding commitment uh, to NATO. Uh, more than 60 years uh, after its creation, uh, NATO remains a vital instrument uh, in the joint endeavor of Europe and America to promote 
freedom. Um, one key reason for NATO's success uh, is its ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, for four decades, the alliance prevented uh, the Cold War from getting hot. And after the end of the Cold War, some felt that the alliance lost its reason uh, to exist. Instead, uh, NATO turned into a real engine for positive change, reaching out to countries all over Europe, helping former foes to become friends, and opening it, its doors to new members. When Yugoslavia broke apart in the 1990s, NATO rallied uh, a unique multinational effort uh, that was instrumental in bringing peace to the Balkans. And uh, after 9-11, uh, NATO took the unprecedented decision to invoke uh, Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. Europe uh, hurried to America's aid, demonstrated in the clearest possible terms that the attack on the United States was considered an attack on all allies. When I learned about the successful operation against Osama bin Laden uh, last week, I congratulated President uh, Obama and the American people because that represented a significant step forward for the security of the 28 NATO allies and of the world as a whole. Bin Laden stood against all those values that NATO has defended for over six decades freedom, democracy, and humanity. And it is now obvious that his evil ideology is bankrupt. Today, uh, NATO has become the unique transatlantic framework for North America and Europe to develop new common answers to new common challenges, such as international terrorism. Our lesson from history is that as the world changes, NATO needs to change too. It needs to be able to influence that changing environment in a positive direction. And it needs to continue fulfilling its fundamental purpose of safeguarding uh, the security and shared values of its member nations. While NATO's past and present speak for themselves, the Alliance's future is not yet written. Um, at President Obama's invitation, NATO leaders will gather next year here in the United States for uh, our next summit meeting. And at that meeting, we will begin to write the next chapter in NATO's evolution and transformation. It is, of course, too early to predict the agenda for the summit, but I do believe it is possible to identify some of the key factors that will shape that agenda. And they can be listed under three broad headings. Commitments, capabilities, and connectivity. First, commitments. As I stand here, nearly 150,000 brave men and women are committed to NATO-led operations on three continents, including about 100,000 Americans. In Asia, 
We are steadily bringing security to Afghanistan and we are training national security forces in Iraq. In Africa, we are protecting the civilians of Libya from the attacks of the Gaddafi regime and we are helping to counter piracy off the coast of Somalia and the Gulf of Aden. And in Europe, we continue to keep the peace in Kosovo as well as provide uh, counter-terrorist patrols in the Mediterranean Sea. This wide range of commitments plays a vital role in the international community's efforts to preserve peace and strengthen security. And it demonstrates that the Alliance is not only responding to change, it is shaping change. Now, second capabilities. Technology is changing rapidly and NATO's capabilities need to keep pace. Our Libya mission has reinforced the need for the Alliance to have available the full range of military capabilities, including those at the techno technological edge. Certain aspects of this operation simply couldn't have been conducted without some of the highly advanced military capabilities of the United States. Drones, surveillance equipment, and precision weapons. One of my concerns is that European allies risk falling behind the pace of technological change because of their low level of defense spending. And this has to be addressed. But when defense budgets are tight, it's not easy. If we acknowledge that there is no more money available right now, then we need to change the way we spend our money. We need to look for new ways to bridge this gap. Many nations are unable to provide individually some of the high-tech equipment we need. But we don't actually need each and every ally to have the full range of equipment. What we do need is this, to have the right equipment within NATO, to enable each ally to play its part and to bring it all together with strong integrated command and control capabilities. And that's why I am promoting the idea of smart defense. Smart defense as part of the answer. Um, it means nations building greater security, not with more resources, but with more coordination and more coherence. This can encourage nations to change their approach from a purely national one to one that favors multinational solutions. The key is for NATO to help nations to develop, to acquire, and to maintain uh, capabilities together that they can't afford alone. I also have to say that if the Europeans are to do more, then they will require help from the United States in particular in improving access to technology and research and development. All this would help the Alliance to have the right capabilities, to keep up with the fast pace of technological change, and to share the burden of developing new capabilities for NATO. Now, finally, connectivity. Terrorism, proliferation, piracy, cyber attacks, 
These new challenges all demonstrate how our security environment is changing. They call for a changed approach to security, a cooperative approach, a connected approach. They call for increased efforts. Um, these new security challenges are faced by many other nations that are not part of NATO. To meet them, we need to connect with other nations and international organizations. NATO already provides a tried and tested framework for partner nations to make their own military contributions to international efforts. Kosovo, Afghanistan and now Libya are clear examples. And the alliance is also increasingly becoming the forum where nations come to discuss new threats and challenges. Over the coming weeks, for example, NATO nations will meet with a wide range of partners to discuss issues such as cyber defense and piracy. Another major issue that we are already discussing in detail with Russia is missile defense cooperation. We agreed at the Lisbon summit that NATO will defend our European territory and populations against ballistic missile attack. This will not change, but we also want to cooperate with Russia. What NATO has in mind is cooperation between two independent missile defense systems. Together, there may be a solution where European NATO territory and populations are protected and people and territories in Russia too. If we achieve this, it will be a tangible demonstration that NATO and Russia can build security together rather than against each other. Ladies and gentlemen, for over 60 years, NATO's success has been founded on common values, common interests, and common approaches, but also on cohesion and commitment. We have learned time and again that North America and Europe are stronger together but weaker apart. Your school's founding father, Paul Nietzsche, once wisely stated that one of the most dangerous forms of human error is forgetting what one is trying to achieve. NATO is very clear on what we must achieve. Through our commitments, our capabilities and our connectivity, the Alliance must continue to meet the challenge of change. With America and Europe working together and with your help and support, I'm confident that it will be successful. Thank you very much. Briefly, a couple announcements before. Uh, my name is Bob Gutman. My Center on Politics and Foreign Relations at SICE is co-host to this. And I'd like to thank the University of California at Washington, Preeti, for all her help. And I'd like to thank Felissa Klubes for all her help putting this all together and doing all the publicity and all the people we've dealt with and worked with at NATO. Uh, he's uh, graciously agreed to answer questions for about 20 minutes. So this is a student uh, group. We're only going to take questions from students. And so I'm going to call on you and uh, give your name and your, and your university for a question. 
Okay. And before, uh, after this is over, everybody please stay in their seats uh, before the Secretary General so he can leave. He has to do some interviews in the back. And then after he's gone, you can all go out and get food. We have food right behind here. So <laughs> something to look forward to there. So, okay, I will take um, open for questions now. Just raise your hand. And if you're a student, I will call on you. You're a student? Okay. And the microphone will be brought around over here. Your Excellency, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come to speak to the University of California and other universities. <laughs> My name is Chris McCoy. I'm from the University of California, San Diego. And I have two questions. One is, do you see a complete withdrawal taking place from Afghanistan in 2014? And also, what will NATO do to support country building if Gaddafi is defeated in Libya? Thank you. We take them one by one. Yes, fine. Um, first, um, um, on uh, Afghanistan. Uh, no, I don't foresee a complete withdrawal um, uh, in 2014 or 2015. What I do envision uh, is a change of our role uh, from combat into support. What we have outlined is a roadmap according to which we will now gradually hand over lead responsibility for the security to the Afghan security forces. That process will start in July this year. We hand over responsibility to the Afghans in seven provinces and districts. We will continue and hopefully see that process completed by the end of 2014. Having said that, it is important to add that we will stay committed also beyond the date when our combat role uh, uh, changes um, or expires. Um, it's important to stay committed uh, because we have to make sure uh, that we do not leave behind a security vacuum uh, in Afghanistan. I feel confident that the Afghans can take responsibility all over Afghanistan by the end of 2014. But it's also important uh, that we tell the Afghan people um, that um, what we want is to make sure that they can stand on their own feet, but they will not stand alone. We will continue to support Afghanistan. Uh, so I foresee a continued presence also beyond 2014, but in quite another role. They will take on combat. We will um, uh, take on support capacity building in Afghanistan. As far as Libya is concerned, in a post-Gaddafi uh, era, I think we may still have a role uh, to play uh, in assisting uh, a new Libyan government in the transition to a sustainable uh, democracy. One of the areas where NATO uh, has a particular expertise is reform of milit the military and security sector uh, and security sectors. Um, and it goes without saying that it is an essential part of transition to democracy that the military and the security sector come under democratic control. To that end, we need reforms, and this is an area in which NATO could assist. Okay. You had Hello, um, Anatoly Homenko from Washington and Lee University. I have two short related questions. One is you talked about uh, the cooperation, partly the potential cooperation between NATO and Russia on missile defenses. Where does such cooperation leave the states that are stuck in between NATO and Russia, like Ukraine, for example, where I come from? And the other question is, recently Russia has shown unwillingness to part with its um, tactical nuclear weapons under disarmament treaties with the United States. And a lot of the experts are saying that, that is for the, the reason for that is that they are hoping to achieve det nuclear deterrence by showing that they have the potential to overcome the ballistic missile shields from NATO. And what does such unwillingness on Russia's part say about Russia's willingness to cooperate with NATO on missile defenses? Thank you. <clears throat> um, 
we um, invited Russia to cooperate on missile defense um, at our uh, summit in Lisbon in November uh, last year. But actually, we broadened it a bit. Uh, in our um, statement from the summit, we invited other uh, interested Euro-Atlantic partners to cooperate as well. And actually, I visited Ukraine. You mentioned Ukraine. I visited Ukraine uh, recently, and um, uh, the Ukrainians um, indicated some interest uh, in exploring the possibilities uh, of uh, uh, cooperation uh, on uh, missile defense. So we have initiated some staff-to-staff -staff talks uh, on that. Um, as regards tactical uh, nuclear weapons, um, I um, hope, maybe I also uh, envision, uh, that uh, a follow-up uh, to the New START Treaty uh, could be uh, negotiations on uh, reductions in the stockpiles uh, of uh, short-range tactical uh, nuclear uh, weapons, um, taking into account uh, that we must ensure a balanced reduction uh, in the stockpiles uh, of uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Let me remind you that uh, uh, within NATO, uh, countries have uh, actually reduced uh, the number of nuclear weapons drastically uh, since the end uh, of the Cold War. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the same has not been the case on the Russian side. So we have to make sure that uh, such steps uh, take uh, place uh, in a balanced uh, manner. Finally, on missile defense, I think the Russians are sincere. Uh, in their uh, wish to explore in detail uh, the possibilities to cooperate uh, on uh, missile defense. No reason to hide that uh, we have not yet fully agreed uh, how uh, could uh, the overall uh, missile defense architecture look like. Uh, but I feel confident that we will uh, reach a, a, an agreement at the end of the day. My name is Astrid Solozano, and I'm part of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Your Excellency, I actually have two questions. My first question is, um, as the world changes and new powers begin to participate in the international sphere, such as Brazil, China, Russia, and India, um, how will the balance of power be affected, if it will be? And my second question to you would be, what is the future of NATO? I know you mentioned that as students, you are, um, you're, asking, you're asking for our support. So in, in what way, would, how could we participate? Uh, uh, sorry, who? As, as students. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, first, uh, on, if I understand you correctly, the, the overall global uh, power balance. Um, well, um, again, I would refer to um, the new strategic concept uh, we adopted uh, at our summit uh, in Lisbon uh, in, in November. A very important element in that new uh, strategic concept is an outreach uh, to uh, partners across the globe. Uh, and uh, we have, in particular, pointed to emerging uh, powers uh, like China, like India, uh, there may be others, uh, with whom uh, we would like to strengthen uh, our uh, partnership. Uh, it is the concept of cooperative uh, security. Uh, we should realize that uh, in today's world, NATO can't accomplish its security missions uh, without engagement with important players on the international scene. Let me just mention Afghanistan as an example. Um, we all know that if we are to ensure long-term peace and stability in Afghanistan and in the region, we also need a positive engagement of Pakistan. So we need a partnership with Pakistan. We also know that if we are to um, uh, engage Pakistan then we'll have to ease tensions 
between Pakistan and uh, India. So that leads to the need for a constructive dialogue with India. We all know that China plays a crucial role in the region. China can be instrumental in ensuring stability in the region. And furthermore, uh, NATO operates on the basis of UN Security Council mandates. We have uh, uh, special relationships with four out of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Three of them are actually allies, the US, the UK, France, and with the fourth, Russia. We have a special partnership within the NATO-Russia Council. But with the fifth, China, we don't have a structured uh, dialogue. And we are now seeking that uh, dialogue. So I think uh, that's the operational part of your uh, question, that we try to reach out and engage uh, important partners on the international uh, scene. How could students uh, play uh, a role uh, in promoting the new uh, NATO? By organizing events like uh, this, uh, by uh, engaging actively um, uh, in um, uh, uh, public events, uh, in debates uh, on uh, the future of uh, our alliance. As an example, um, we um, prepared a new strategic concept that was adopted in November last year, as mentioned. And in the preparation of that, we organized a lot of public events. Uh, we used our website uh, actively. And uh, a lot of representatives from the young generation contributed with their uh, ideas as to how we could modernize uh, our alliance. Uh, and I would very much like to see uh, that engagement uh, con continued. Um, um, and this is also a reason why I always request uh, meetings with uh, representatives of the young generation when I do my uh, uh, travels, my tours, like this uh, US uh, tour, uh, where I've had the opportunity to meet uh, with uh, students uh, in different parts uh, of, of the United States. So I think there are a number of uh, possibil possibilities and uh, I look very much forward uh, to your active uh, engagement uh, in continued renewal of uh, our alliance. We've had a couple of UC and Washington and Lee, so I'm looking for Johns Hopkins, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right here. Um, hi, my name is Cordelia Chestnut. I'm from Johns Hopkins, SAIS. I'm also a Danish citizen, so welcome to you, Mr. Paul Rasmussen. Um, I have a question to you regarding the uh, refugee flows that are coming from Libya into Europe right now. Um, one of the issues in the European Union at the moment is the island of Lampedusa off of the, the Italian coast. Um, the UN resolution that supported uh, NATO's operation in Libya had a protection of civilian clause in it. and. Um, I was wondering whether you could expand on the, how you interpret that civilian protection mandate and what NATO's operations are in the Mediterranean in support of, of Italy and the, um, the refugee flows that Europe is, is now seeing. Um, <clears throat> the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 um, is quite clear. In uh, paragraph 4, it speaks about the protection of civilians uh, it's requested that we protect civilians against attacks and we are mandated to take all necessary measures to achieve that uh, goal. Furthermore, uh, the resolution uh, mandates uh, the uh, enforcement of a no-fly zone and uh, an arms embargo. And uh, our operation uh, aims at implementing that uh, UN Security Council resolution fully. You mentioned um, the refugee uh, problem or challenge. Um, it's not uh, explicitly uh, mentioned uh, in uh, the UN Security Council uh, resolution, but it goes without saying that uh, um, uh, vessels uh, under NATO command operating in the Mediterranean are obliged 
uh, to participate uh, in uh, uh, rescue operations uh, if needed at sea. Uh, that follows uh, from uh, legal commitments um, uh, and uh, actually uh, NATO commanded vessels uh, have participated in such uh, rescue uh, operations. His Excellency, welcome. My name is Nicoletta Giordani. I'm a SAIS student. Uh, I'd like for you to go back to the uh, missile defense cooperation with Russia and bring some light uh, um, about the uh, relationship with Russia regarding uh, NATO enlargement and the potential controversy about Georgia and Ukraine and how those two things fit together. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's of course a good question. Uh, can we reconcile all these uh, elements? Uh, let me say right from the outset that uh, we do have our disagreements uh, with uh, Russia. And, and you mentioned one of the areas, namely Georgia. Um, we insist uh, on uh, full respect for Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We uh, pursue a non-recognition policy as regards Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, we call on Russia to fulfill fully uh, her international uh, obligations. Uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, I would say, a very robust dialogue uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, on an issue like uh, Georgia, because there are clear disagreements. We also know that um, more generally, uh, Russia uh, is uh, very skeptical about not to speak about opposed to uh, NATO's open door uh, policy. Some camps in Moscow uh, consider our open door policy, the fact that we have enlarged uh, NATO, as uh, directed uh, uh, against uh, Russia. Uh, I don't agree. Uh, on the contrary, the fact that um, uh, that we have um, uh, taken on board a number of countries uh, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe uh, has actually contributed uh, to creating stability, uh, in uh, along uh, Russia's uh, western uh, borders, um, something that Russia has strived for during centuries, I would say. Thanks to our open door policy, we have promoted not only stability, but also prosperity in Eastern and Central Europe. In that respect, uh, it plays a crucial role that these countries have also become members of the European Union. But these things together have created a space of security, stability, prosperity in Eastern and Central Europe, which has been to the benefit of Russia. So, I spent some words on this because it's very important for me to stress that we do not compromise on basic principles. Our door remains open and no country outside NATO can veto uh, uh, NATO uh, enlargement. But having said all that, it's important that this, these disagreements don't overshadow uh, the fact that we do share security concerns with Russia uh, in a number of areas. And one of them is actually uh, the missile uh, threat. Over 30 countries in the world have missile capabilities or are aspiring to get missile capabilities. Some of them can hit targets uh, on NATO uh, territory. But actually they can also hit targets on Russian territory. So we are faced with the same threat, and against that threat, we need um, cooperation uh, to protect our populations. So this is, 
how we want to deal with it, you might call it a two-track approach, uh, that uh, we will continue uh, a robust dialogue uh, on all the issues where we disagree, but at the same time, we try to move forward uh, on those areas where we share uh, security concerns with the aim to develop a true strategic partnership. And in the word, or in the term, strategic partnership uh, is also included a constructive dialogue on issues where we might disagree. We have time for one more question, and uh, right now for all the students who are going to do the interview, if you could leave now and go back to the room so you can be waiting for the Secretary General when he, when he comes. Um, okay, you're right up here. She's right here. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Zal Doherty. I'm from the University of California, Davis. Uh, you spoke earlier about uh, the need for constructive dialogue between India and Pakistan. And I was wondering what's NATO's role, if any, um, in confronting Pakistan on their domestic terrorism problems? Well, of course, NATO as such is not engaged uh, in uh, Pakistan, but there are certain aspects uh, of uh, our operation uh, in Afghanistan that also uh, necessitate uh, a dialogue uh, with uh, Pakistan. And um, um, uh, during recent years, uh, NATO uh, has developed a relationship uh, with uh, Pakistan um, at all levels. Um, we have um, invited uh, Pakistani journalists, uh, Pakistani parliamentarians, Pakistani military uh, to visit NATO headquarters. Uh, we have had a political dialogue with uh, representatives uh, of uh, uh, the Pakistani uh, government. Last year I visited uh, Islamabad. Uh, I suggested uh, to develop a political framework for uh, further enhancement uh, of uh, our cooperation uh, and uh, our relationship. So we have actually taken uh, a number of uh, initiatives. Furthermore, um, speaking about our operation in Afghanistan, we also have military-to-military -military, um, cooperation, uh, in particular with a view to uh, the cha security challenges uh, in the border region. Um, we appreciate that the Pakistani military and government have taken steps to uh, reinforce the fight against terrorists in the tribal areas in the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. We'd, but we do believe that there is potential for strengthened efforts, in particular uh, in the fight against the so-called Haqqani uh, network. So we have uh, a dialogue uh, with, uh, with uh, Pakistan uh, and um, I would say despite recent events that raise a number of questions to be answered uh, after the successful operation against Osama bin Laden, despite all that I think the bottom line is that we need a strong cooperation uh, uh, with Pakistan if we are to ensure long-term peace and stability in Afghanistan and in the region. Thank you very much. And if everybody could stay seated until he, he leaves.